Welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. I want to start off by acknowledging that uh, the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish people on which we are learning, working, and organizing today. TAM is specifically situated on the tribal lands of the Puyallup Tribe of Indians, and uh, we are thankful for our on ongoing partnership with them. My name is Amelia Layton, and I'm the Public Programs Manager uh, at TAM. I'm usually behind the scenes organizing festivals and Thursday night programming, but I'm also excited to be able to spend some more time, even virtually, with this incredible Forgotten Stories exhibition. Um, a little bit more about the exhibition, if uh, you haven't had a chance to see it or explore it. Uh, during the economic hard times of the 1930s, the US government, or U.S. government art projects under the WPA and other agencies created a wealth of public art and supported art communities across the country. In the Northwest, hundreds of artists were employed and thousands of artworks created, but their story is almost unknown. Forgotten Stories, Northwest Public Art of the 1930s offers an extensive overview of the bounty of work created in our region and brings forgotten treasures back into view. I want to encourage you to check out the wealth of information we have online and to spend some time on a virtual tour that Margaret and our uh, lovely staff at TAM put together as we went into quarantine. So you can see the exhibit even though we can't be there in person. Um, I'll put that link in the chat box. And um, also I wanna highly recommend this big amazing book uh, this is the breadth of work that is in here is incredible. Well, amazing photos. So it's uh, incredible essays by both of the people you're going to hear from tonight and uh, everyone should have one. So I'll put the links to those in the chat box as soon as we get started. Um, I'm joined tonight by our interim chief curator and curator of collections and special exhibitions, <laughs> Margaret Bullock who has spent the past 18 years working on this project, and Nina Olson, a researcher and conservator of paintings based in Portland, Oregon, and she has 30 years of conservation experience. And I'm so excited to learn more about the details around conservation and discovery of these works of art. So as I said in the beginning during the talk, I'll be doing my best to monitor the chat box um, and checking in on the Q and A's. So if you have questions that come up, um, put those in the Q&A and I'll try to get them into the conversation and if not we'll discuss those at the end of the of the the chat here at uh, around seven. This will probably be about an hour and then some time for some chat. Uh, so that's the housekeeping. So Margaret and Nina thank you both for being here. Good to see you both. Yeah it's my pleasure. Always fun to just hang out with Nina and talk about this, this, these artworks and what's been happening with them. Yeah, it's really exciting. Um, we've all, all the staff at least, have been really disappointed that we didn't get to spend as much time with this exhibit as we all had hoped. So really glad we get to do it virtually. Um, so Nina, if you could start off by just sort of telling us a little bit about your history in conservation, maybe like how you became a, con a conservator and then like what does that even mean to conserve paintings and stuff? Yeah, sure. Um, my own background as an undergraduate student was really in art history and studio arts and I felt a strong connection between those two and the epiphany sort of happened when I went abroad for my junior year abroad and I was studying in Florence, Italy, and I discovered this field that combined sort of technical art history, which I was very interested in, and applied chemistry, applied science, um, and it opened up a whole world. It was like, oh my goodness, it brought all of these skills that I've been developing together, um, and it became front and center for my future studies and uh, of course my whole career. Um, but in terms of what conservation is, it, it's definitely a very interdisciplinary uh, sort of pursuit. It combines technical art history, it combines uh, sort of applied chemistry as I was saying, it also includes a very good knowledge of conservation history, the philosophy, the ethics involved, and then how those can be applied um, to specific cases. So each individual piece is very unique 
and has its own subset of uh, problems. So we learn to apply those general sort of knowledge at, um, information to resolve specific conservation needs. And so we feel like we are sort of in between and oftentimes working in collaboration with an art historian like Margaret, um, how, being supported by conservation scientists. And so we sort of work in a very collaborative way with other people that are helping us to understand as much as possible about indiv each individual artwork. Wonderful, thank you. And then Margaret, if you could explain to us a little bit about how you came to spend 18 years working on uh, WPA era art. Yeah, it's, uh, it's one of those stories where I actually, I didn't want the, the project when it was handed to me originally. Um, I was working as uh, an assistant curator at the Portland Art Museum in Oregon, and we had received a grant from the Henry Luce Foundation to do three small, pub three small brochures on aspects of the American art collection. And she was doing two of them and she said, well, this will be great experience for you. We have this huge group of um, New Deal art in the collection. We don't know anything about it and you can do this other brochure. And I, I had been focusing in my own studies on 19th century American art. I had done my master's thesis on Winslow Homer. And so I wasn't anywhere near 20th century modernist WPA art. And so started out reluctantly, but then I'm also a, a research geek and um, started looking into it and finding out that there was all this information that was missing and that we didn't know and that there was sort of a treasure hunt to do and a mystery to solve and lots of puzzle pieces put together and those are all things I love to do. So I got more and more um, interested and um, was lucky through the grant to have funding to go to the National Archives in Washington DC where what records there are are, are gathered together um, and spend the time there on a couple of different research visits and um, it, I wasn't, um, I, I always like to say, I haven't been working on it continuously for 18 years. <laughs> it's partly life, you know, comes and goes, you go in other directions, you work on other projects. Um, but it's kind of stretched out over time. So I worked on it quite intently in Portland and then I went on to other things and then left that museum um, for a couple of years, left the Northwest altogether. And then when I came back um, to work at the Tacoma Art Museum, um, I started looking into what had been happening in Washington state and then found out that Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Montana were all considered a single region together. And, and so expanded the project to include, um, to include all of those. So that's how it's partly why it's taken um, so long. It's a lot and other things come in the way. And um, it took a lot of prodding to make me actually write the book I had been talking about for 15 years. <laughs> As Nina Wells know, and some of the attendees of this this webinar know too, it took a long time to get me to get off the block and do it. Well, the book is really good, and so you should be. We're all proud of that work, and um, Very kind. I've been reading it in quarantine, and it's been fascinating. So, <laughs> something to do. Something to do with great pictures, um, which is really key to an art book. So. Um, so uh, for both of you, I guess we can start to talk about how these things are discovered and many of these works of arts have been covered or abandoned to storage. Um, so can you tell us, and you both have different stories and maybe they overlap about how you go about researching and discovering works of art from this time period. And if you wanna share some images that you have, that would be great too. Margaret, you're the discoverer. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's funny because you have all, to, from my point of view, you have all the fun actual going and finding things, discovery stories, and I find all of mine in the archives, and um, I'm the strange lady at the table next to other researchers who's getting all excited about some letter I found. Um, but yeah, so for me, it, it really was um, bits and pieces pulling together. So when I started this research and realized there was no, there were some, some uh, a thesis or two and then some other work that people had done with some basic lists and things but um, I realized that there was no comprehensive source so as I went through the documents in the archives I just started a, a spreadsheet um, of information and plugged in things as I found it and then as things came along I could start connecting dots um, and one of the discoveries we'll talk about in a bit I think is the discovery of this group of uh, photographs from the Oregon um, WPA that really helped a lot too in putting together. So um, it's a lot of that 
hearsay and finding photographs and seeing signatures and coming across letters and then artworks. So the artworks for the projects when they were turned in, they all had a label attached that was a government label and not all of those labels survive, but a number of them do. So those also people will find something and they'll just come around and say, I've got this work with this label on it. What is this about? So it's been all of those things together that have, um, that have helped find it. And then um, Nina is a major source for me. So, cause she goes and sees things. So I love seeing emails come up for her in my inbox because often there are things I don't even know have been rediscovered and she's actively doing something to work on them. <laughs> so. um, well, Unlike uh, Margaret that starts, you know, on the archival end, which is how usually research is conducted, right? I usually um, come in to um, become knowledgeable about something because something terrible has happened, a disaster has occurred, vandalism has occurred, or a building is going to be demolished. So oftentimes I am consulted as a conservator because people don't exactly know how to approach or if it's worth, if it has value. Um, so, so I usually come way after the fact, like just at the, at the tail end of, of uh, you know, an artwork's life span in a certain area or in a certain building. And so I'm oftentimes called in to, to kind of help transition into um, a conservation phase, a preservation activity, or perhaps even removing and relocating an artwork. So I do have some images if we should just jump into those. Yeah, do you guys have specific stories that you could uh, speak to or images that maybe we could have a little bit more of that story of a particular work of art? That would be great. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to just uh, share my screen with you. Um, so this was actually the first uh, WPA mural that I worked on in 2003, which is, uh, can you all see the screen? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and it's uh, a large mural by Howard Sewell that was uh, located in the old um, Oregon City High School campus. And in, I believe, 2001, uh, Oregon City passed a bond measure to build uh, a beautiful updated high school. And, um, and so they started wondering about these murals, if um, they should stay, if they should be brought along. And they had an appraisal done and understood their historic value. So I was called in to um, help um, remove those. And uh, here's an image of, let's see. Okay, here's an image of the way they looked in the library, the old library of the old campus um, in 2003. So they kind of occupied the far ends of the building. And um, Ginny Allen uh, found in uh, some archival uh, source, I'm not sure which, some of the photographs of the individual pieces of the mural that tell a little bit of a story about how WPA murals are oftentimes created. Um, the works were frequently painted off-site, so uh, they were painted in the studio or somewhere else, and then on canvas, and then they were um, attached to the wall, which is a process called meriflaging, and um, after the building was complete. Oftentimes these were actually created for buildings that were being um, actually built during the WPA. So here are two sections of the murals that um, were being photographed before installation. And uh, once uh, I got to uh, sort of examine the condition, there were a number of issues. You could see a terrible flaking, uh, like over here. They'd had some previous treatment. You can see this orange paint from an overpainting, and over here, quite a bit of flaking. And then beyond that, the acoustic ceiling actually was covering up about an inch and a half of each one of the murals. Um, so we had to remove that in order to remove the murals. And the process is quite laborious. Um, it involves applying a protective facing, which is paper. You can see sort of uh, adhered to the surface here. And then uh, literally detaching um, the canvas from the substrate plaster, which can be easy or difficult depending on the tensile strength of the adhesive that was used. Um, some during the WPA, it was recommended to use something called lead white paste, which was uh, just an off, uh, offshoot product of uh, paint creation, I believe. And so 
this particular case was actually adhered with lead white pa paste. And um, the way that it's removed is literally with some sort of a modified spatula that has like a thin edge so that you're able to cleave or detach the canvas from the substrate. And here's an image of the back once we'd removed one section and you can see the lead white paste is quite tenacious and also pulls away a significant amount of plaster sometimes, which um, is necessary to remove it and, uh, and then it can just be cleaned off. And in this particular case, we needed to uh, put them on a new backing so that they could be reinstalled in the new school and here are a couple of images of uh, on the left preparing the new um, lining or the new support um, that's being rolled out there and then carefully positioning the pieces um, on this lining support, sealing it within um, some special uh, film so that it can be enclosed in a vacuum seal. Um, and you can see here um, it's taped at the perimeter so as to create like an enclosed um, envelope and here's a vacuum pump that helps to remove the air and so that brings the back of the canvas into close proximity to the new relining canvas. Um, and we've also inserted uh, an interleaf of a thermoplastic uh, adhesive so that means that it becomes tacky when it reaches a specific heat temperature, activation temperature. And for this specific um, project I created a new device and you can see this sort of rust colored uh, mat that's laid underneath uh, the, the um, envelope and that was a heat transfer device that I just made ad hoc for this project um, which has eventually turned 17 years later has refined significantly and now we just um, my colleague and I actually uh, just presented this at the Yale Conserving Canvas Symposium last fall um, that was sponsored by the Getty. So it was one of these projects that became then like a, a source of research that kind of helped to develop um, better bench working tools to improve treatment outcomes for other conservators. And here, here's the piece being installed in once in the entryway and then in the media room. And I, thanks so much for having those images of the process because I, I try to explain um, to people how that, that works and it's really hard to get it across that when you say, well, no, they're just canvases that have been glued to the wall and that can be removed. And it's really hard to um, conceptualize that, particularly the scale of some of these, like how is that possible? And also that's how a few of them have survived really is that they were taken down um, and rolled up and put away. So that has saved a few of them just from having been you know, the rest of the building maybe has been demolished, but the painting was saved. So I have a question about that too, and so does one of our guests. Um, we're just intrigued by that heating process, and it mm -hmm. says that was something you you developed, um, or, um, and when it's in between those two layers, those don't stay on there in the end. Is that just to to adhere the two together? Is that part of that process, or I guess? So the cross section is that there's a new support, which is the white material that there was an image um, yeah. like here. So this is the new support here. And you can see the edge of it is a slightly different color than here. This darker gray color is actually where the adhesive is. It's called Viva, it's a thermoplastic resin. So that is a sort of uh, an interleaf between the backing and the canvas. So it's like an adhesive between those two surfaces. Mm -hmm. And does the heat is necessary for that adhesive to, to work, I guess? Correct. Oh, so wonderful. The, the, they're thermoplastic, so they activate at 150 degrees Fahrenheit. So in, until you reach that heat activation temperature, it doesn't become tacky and it doesn't um, have any adhesive property. I see. That's fascinating. And you're, that's a thing you've created, that platform. Um, well, the, the adhesive itself is widely used. So I, that's been in use from, since the 1970s, actually. But just uh, the use of um, a small heat transfer device, like the one that I was describing, this one. And this is actually quite large. I, you know, the, I have ones now that are one inch by five inch. So you can just have very local and targeted application of very low temperatures. 
So it's something that allows uh, conservators to apply judiciously exactly where and exactly how much heat they want um, to use, which is heat is oftentimes um, implement, you know, used for any kind of a structural treatment. It's one of those um, very important um, components to just about any structural treatment to, of paintings on canvas. Thank you. Okay. Um, you were just talking about a, a building being demolished and that was actually this case here of these two fabulous paintings that are by Louis Bunce and Clifford Gleason that were in Bush Elementary School in Salem. And um, I had just given birth to my daughter and somebody, well, actually a whole committee, including Roger and Bonnie Hull, um, Ginny and others uh, approached me because there was imminent demolition of a building that housed these um, that was going to be occurring in Salem. So this was another case where they were removed sort of under duress. And um, I think actually, Margaret, you provided some of these images to the task force, the committee that was set up to sort of save these. Is that correct? Yeah, and that's one of the discoveries I, I kind of referenced a little bit um, earlier on. We, we had this sort of amazing thing happen once I had started this research at Portland Art Museum, there was a graduate student um, working with us as well. Um, and she was working on some other aspect of the collection, but she came across and she was working look specifically in some of the photographs. And she came across a reference in a file to these boxes that had been sent to the museum in the 1950s and that just had this kind of strange US Forest Service label on them. So she tracked them down um, and I remember that day I still get, it happens every time, the hair on the back of my neck goes up. I remember the phone call from the other building. She's like, you have to get over here. You won't believe what I just found. And I was sure it was just like another letter because that's what we both got excited about. And I get over there and there are these boxes that are full of negatives, which turn out to be the photo archive or at least part of it from the Oregon um, WPA project. And so part of the grant money went to um, us scanning them, the negatives, so that we could turn them into positives. And all of these incredible images started popping up of artists at work and um, helped us track some things down, but then also helped uh, people like Nina and, and others who were looking into these to figure out what these were, maybe where they were in a building and um, who was working on them and all those, those great things. So that's, yeah, that's where these came from, is from that archive. Well, these images are just incredible. I mean, um, they really show the artistic process, how the artist was transferring from a small sketch, especially in this slide. You can see he has a small sketch here, uh, which he's developing into a full-scale cartoon on the left, and also this one on the right. And um, he's using a quadratura, a very traditional way of um, upscaling an image with these, this grid mark there. Um, in this image, you can see right here, there's actually um, a pouncing drawing. So another sort of medieval technique uh, where you create a drawing and then you make a number of tiny holes and then transfer that drawing onto your definitive image by uh, using charcoal. So he, they rubbed charcoal and it just, tra it just migrated through those little tiny holes. And this is like the, the pouncing drawing right there. So, and then here on the right, they're actually painting on canvas. You can see the canvas is uh, stretched onto a stretcher. So these are just incredible images for kind of reconstructing the artistic process, how they were, you know, how, how they were coming up with the original sketch and then upscaling that, making it into a, like a definitive image. I love too that you get some of those details of how, how much it was really a, a, a shoestring project, you know, that people just used what they had. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think back to the images you just showed us of your, your assistance on lifts and and of scaffolds and all of this. And here, you know, there's Louis sitting on a rickety old wooden ladder and someone else is standing on a chair. And um, we see in others, you know, that the paint can is some old, you know, maybe it's an old can of beans that they washed out and used to hold the paintbrush. Right. So I love that sort of detail to him too, that you really get caught up in the period, period moment um, that you can yeah, see. Yeah, it captures the whole atmosphere of it. It's, they're fantastic. The other thing I love about this project is there's a lot of confusion 
um, among people as to what what work was done for what projects. And in a lot of instances, it doesn't really matter except to people like me who, who worry about that. But when it comes to issues like um, buildings that are being sold or um, renovated and the mural needs to be moved or something needs to be done with it, it becomes a real issue because ownership and who paid for what and all of that really is central to who then also has the decision making um, capability at this point to decide what to do with these works. And this one was a really interesting kind of cross because the artist working on it, the main artist overseeing it is working for the federal art project, but the, it wasn't a commission through the project. He was doing it as an instructor through one of the art centers and his students helped. And then one of the students went on to work at the art. So it's this very confusing chain. So even to unravel it with Bonnie and Roger, like who did sponsor this project? So then who owned it and how did it end up in the school? Um, right. Ended up being important because then it became who gets to own it and, and decide what to do. Right. We have this a question. image was really interesting for me because it shows how they were actually putting the canvas up. And in this case, they didn't use that lead white paste. They just used uh, some sort of animal glue that perhaps they thought was more compatible with this project. And, um, and in fact, oh, I thought you would be interested in talking maybe about this one, I'm not sure. But anyway, it was very useful to see, oh, okay, he's not applying with a spatula lead white paste, he's applying with a brush from a bucket, you know, this <laughs> liquid <glue. laughs> Again, using chairs as ladders. Can we just, uh, there's a great question about the subject of that work, which mm -hmm. has fascinated me too, because I am very intrigued by that Alice in Wonderland kind of feel. Um, uh, the anonymous attendees said it's a little bit dark for an elementary school, maybe. Do we know anything about uh, what the artist's directions were? Or was it pretty broad? Like, here's a space, make a mural? <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know. It, it was for uh, the library in an elementary school. So that was really the theme was to choose children's books um, and fairy tales. And they chose fairy tales and favorite children's books. Which can so be pretty Alice dark. in Wonderland is the theme of one and then the other. But it, it's funny that, that that comment because when the murals, it came time to put them back in a school after they'd been um, conserved, there was this concern that they were too scary for, for kids now, and that's why they're now in a high school instead of the elementary school. And, you know, to me, knowing, having watched my, my eight-year-old nephew, what he watches and playing Halo and things like that, it's like, how is this more terrifying? <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that's an interesting, interesting concern. Yeah. Thank you. Anyway, these are some images of uh, them in their original niches in the old library of the Bush Elementary School. Um, you can see they, um, here on the edges, they'd been sort of overpainted by wall paint. And here on the right, you can see flaking because the, the painting was actually done in tempera, um, which is a water-based type of paint. And so it was quite fragile and um, vulnerable. Um, so the, the treatment was actually twofold. First to consolidate and, and sort of stabilize that crumbly, friable paint, and then to remove it from the wall before they demolished the school. Um, so uh, these are just a couple more pictures that show how you remove one. Um, you set up basically a reel that's on a spindle that sort of collects the canvas as you're detaching it. And you have to have a few people. This is, um, I mean, these projects are so important to have really good crews that are uh, working together. So um, so thankful for all the people that have helped me over the years um, to do these difficult uh, projects. Um, anyway, here are a couple more with Retta helping me to remove this one. And here was maybe a couple of mo uh, months afterwards. And you can see these are the two niches where the murals had been. So um, that was just a fantastic image of showing um, how the building was gone. <laughs> yeah. And back in the studio, again, this one was also mounted onto uh, a rigid backing so that it could be um, uh, reversibly uh, um, it reinstalled in a new location. And actually it was installed in North Salem High School's auditorium, which as you said, the edgy uh, sort of uh, tone and subject matter um, 
I think really appeals to high school students. I think they like it probably. It's kind of surrealist. I like that you included a photograph of the demolition because it's that reminder too that some of these projects, these moments, they're emergency salvage that you often don't know anything about it until it's like weeks from it happening. There's been a number of these stories where people are having to try and organize quickly to do something to try and save works before whatever is about to happen to them happens. Um, and yet it's a very complicated process. And then there's the issue of where does it go because they're not tiny and maybe the subject is odd or inappropriate um, for certain settings and things like that. So it's a really fascinating um, and problematic, you know, that it has to be sometimes the sort of, you have two weeks, to come up with a solution for dealing with this work. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Should we just move forward, Amelia? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I think I was kind of referencing a little bit of the use of a very traditional uh, artistic technique by, by Bunce. He was studying at the Art uh, Students League in New York where um, Thomas Hart Benton was teaching sort of neo or revival of uh, Renaissance uh, techniques of egg tempera painting and tempera painting. And that's sort of, I think Margaret and I kind of discussed this, it seems to be sort of a, a theme in general, not only in, um, in the painting, but also in other aspects of the New Deal projects. There was this concentration on craftsmanship, very traditional crafts like uh, wrought, wrought iron and uh, woodworking and whatnot. And so this was another really interesting project um, that came to me by um, from the PTA of Chapman Elementary School. The president, Rosie Platt, um, uh, approached me about helping to conserve this uh, mural that had been in the entrance foyer of Chapman Elementary School, but was in very bad condition. And the work itself is by a, a woman artist named Amy Spencer Gorham, and it's done in wood marquetry. So, uh, for those of the, you that are not familiar with it, wood marquetry is the use of veneers to create figurative images. So in, um, it, was, it was widely used in Renaissance Italy and it was used in these sort of large architectural applications. Um, but of course, everybody knows a lot about inlaid furniture and uh, trays and whatnot. So they were much smaller uh, smaller objects um, and it was very commonly used and especially in the Pacific Northwest where there was a lot of furniture making. So there was just an abundance of these beautiful and very rare um, veneers. Um, so she was able to actually create these large architectural format marquetry pieces thanks to the use of another brand new novel product that had been created um, in the Pacific Northwest uh, which was plywood in four by eight sheets. It was a very novel um, um, product for wood forest product. And one of the, for me, super exciting parts of this project was bringing in Dr. Susanna Radivojevic, who is a wood scientist and completely nerded out when she saw this um, stamp on the back of one of the reverses of these murals. <laughs> Uh, which was a stamp, original stamp from the Douglas Fir um, Plywood Association. And so she started studying, um, uh, you know, how these artworks kind of fall into a development of a lot of wood products that was happening for architectural applications. So we kind of um, understood this work to be not only inspired by Renaissance techniques, but also using brand new wood products that were very much products of the Pacific Northwest. Um, and in fact, she uh, came up with this amazing image in the middle of uh, a piece of um, Douglas fir plywood that would had been actually shown in the Lewis and Clark uh, exhibition in 1905. This was obviously a later image, but it's the same piece of plywood. And that just enriched the project so much for, um, for a technical knowledge of just not the surface, but also the behind the back. That's incredible. And it's like a minimalist painting, just a piece of plywood. <laughs> the, the condition was really bad. There were all of these edges of the veneer that were lifting. And um, this is an image in raking light. So you can see sort of 80 years of accumulated damage 
um, here you can see because they were just easily accessible from for, uh, by the students there was a lot of vandalism a lot of incisions and actually some uh, losses of wood um, here you can see a couple of areas of loss where pieces of veneer had been removed um, so the for the project the pieces were, were removed in order to work on them in the studio and um, we had a a con conservator working with us that was actually specialized in wood panel um, conservation. So he designed sort of this sliding um, bridge that would allow us to apply targeted pressure to cover the entire surface. So this is again very interdisciplinary using people from a number of different um, areas uh, to kind of come to a great solution. And here um, was after we stabilized and all of the veneer, we had to kind of deal with the front, um, which was covered with a lot of different uh, materials. Um, it had been uh, coated with a polyurethane coating probably in the 80s. And it had also been used as sort of um, uh, a billboard. So teachers and community had used it, just taped things up to it for announcing, you know, a bake sale or whatever. And then upon removal, that would remove some of the surface coatings. So you had these little areas that are sort of square, that was where the tape was applied and it just kind of pulled things off. Um, here you can see some food or something that was thrown at the right panel and just kind of had dripped down. So in order to figure this out, we use, for example, UV light that induces a fluorescence, which allows us to understand um, more about the more information about what's on the surface. One thing that I thought was very interesting was on the far edges uh, that had been obscured underneath the frame was this bright orange fluorescence, which is typical of shellac. So mm -hmm. it gave us a little bit of insight into her own finishing process. She didn't bring it to the school already finished. She installed it and then finished it in situ. Um, so cleaning had to take into account all of the different directions of grain and softness and hardness of the woods. So we actually um, treated during the cleaning uh, part each individual area um, separately, breaking it down into sections and we'd apply a rayon piece of facing tissue, a very thin tissue um, that was cut out to be the precise size and then applied on top of that uh, a solvent mixture that was suspended in a stiff gel and um, and then enclosed with some uh, mylar sheeting to just hold the fumes in place. And here's an image sort of during some of the early testing. So you can see on the right after removal of all of that sort of darkened grime, but mainly the polyurethane, which had become very opaque, you get this is the cleaned area and this is the dirty area. So this is also in fluorescence. You can see this is the polyurethane and this is the cleaned area. There were, uh, there was a lot of extra work to do in these areas of scratches because obviously it was, um, uh, had just opened up all of the uh, fibers of the wood and sort of soaked in a lot of the polyurethane. So that was a little bit difficult to remove. And here are just some before on the left, after on the right images to just let you see the change. We have a question that leads into one of my next questions that I was gonna ask you and as we're getting closer on time here, um, mm -hmm. we can continue looking at your beautiful slides, but I was wondering, um, someone rightly said, don't we all own WPA artwork, which is kind of what led me to this next question of like, who's responsible for this work? Are governments trying to preserve them or is it up to institutions to step in and care for these works? It seems like Margaret said that sometimes you just get calls or you said that sometimes you just get calls, like come rescue this work right now. Um, so like, how is this funded, I guess, is a, another question too. Um, well, as as Margaret was saying, um, it's oftentimes put together quickly, but not always. At any rate, um, the, the way that the guidelines work is that if it's an immobile work, so something that's adhered to the wall or it's part of the architecture, the stewardship responsibilities are with the owner. Mm -hmm. So if it's 
in a spe in a building that's owned by you know a school system or something like that the schools are the stewards and they're the owners of the artwork um, whereas prints easel paintings things that are mobile those are forever um, uh, administered by the GSA. And so they are the ones that actually um, pretend ownership and stewardship of those pieces. In terms of who pays for it, it's generally um, fundraising that combines private and um, public money. Uh, for the last project you saw, we received funding from the Oregon Heritage Commission, the Autzen Foundation, um, so we we were lucky to have uh, funding from both uh, the private sector and uh, the Oregon Heritage Commission, the National Trust for Historic Preservation. So we were able to patch together money to to conserve them. The ownership question gets stickier with different projects. It sort of depends on the project um, the the work was made for. So for the post office murals, for example, or some of the more complicated because over the years, um, post offices have been decommissioned or they built a new building and they no longer want the old building. And, and sometimes they'll decide they don't wanna take the mural that was created for the old building either. So they'll sell the old building and they'll, but they won't transfer the rights to the artwork in the building. It remains government owned. And usually in your sales or your purchase agreement, you have to agree that it will be made available to the public should someone ask to see it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so there's this strange history with a number of these where now sometimes there may be an organization that has bought the building and maybe the content of the mural is problematic for them for some reason and they want to get rid of it or cover it up or do something to it and um, paint over it, add to it. Um, and they aren't allowed by the regulations because it's the government's piece of work. So it's a really, it's a complicated, um, and sometimes there's definitely because it costs so much money um, to do this work there's often a sort of pass the potato um, situation too, where people are like, well, it's in our school, but we don't own it. So it's not, you know, we're not responsible and, and it gets sort of confused, but. Right. I also wanted to note, there was a, a small question um, in the Q&A too, for your first slide of the Gorham, um, Nina, that someone was asking about that little grid of colored squares in front of the photograph, in front of the piece. And um, that's a color chart that we use to help make sure that the color of the photograph matches the actual color of the artwork. So it's a way to sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, um, calibrate the, the color palettes. Correct. Um, there was this one last project that I, I just wanted to bring up because again, it, it, it kind of connects back to Margaret's discovery of all these incredible uh, negatives. Um, and they were actually the inspiration and the impetus for rediscovering this work of art. It was a whole series of photos by Minor White, who he himself, very important photographer, and he photo documented the, the completed mural by Eric LeMade that um, Margaret, I believe you found the, uh, the information that connected the photographs to the location Abernathy Elementary School. Um, and so this was a really fun project to work on and it's actually ongoing right now because of how unique you kind of start with these images of the, the paintings before you even know where they are. And uh, so this is just some collages together of images um, to give an idea of what this uh, mural looked like. The title of it is a pageant of Oregon history and it's organized sort of as a linear chronological frieze that surrounds the old library building of Abernathy. And so here in this side, you can see the arrival of, for example, Lewis and Clark here and previously uh, only indigenous people. So in, indigenous people are represented as the original uh, uh, people that were here in Oregon. Um, and then this long west wall that includes a lot of uh, sort of historic characters like John McLaughlin and Jason Lee and Dr. Elijah White. Um, on the far end are again sort of important uh, legislators and governors and um, the representations here of Oregon Trail settlers arriving and then it kind of ends up on this sort of what it would have been contemporary in 1941, um, the natural resources of uh, Oregon being lumber and shipping. So um, those are both represented. 
Uh, but when uh, Ginny Allen came to me with this information and she said she was interested in and in trying to pursue it and I was so excited, it seemed like such a fun project. So she actually went through the school and was able to match up the archival photographs with what seemed to be uh, the, the same um, appearance in the current building. And, in, and this is actually the old library of the building. And so um, immediately after that, I was uh, granted permission by Portland Public Schools to do some exploratory tests in the room. And I chose this sort of exterior wall because it probably would have had the most compromised condition. And I was just trying to assess if it was plausible and um, to remove the material on top. And uh, if it could have, uh, you know, if the quality was good enough, if the condition was good enough to actually allow for it to be recovered. And they don't know exactly when it occurred, but sometime around 1960, um, uh, the then superintendent, uh, Robert Blanchard, uh, sort of issued a deed, uh, an idea that we should really spruce up and freshen up all of the schools. And in this particular case, it meant painting over this mural. So um, even though it was painted in 1941, only about 20 years later, it was uh, overpainted with oil paint. And um, so it had been hidden, obscured, sort of, uh, hidden in plain sight here until 2007 when I did some of these tests and there were actually six layers of paint on top and um, it was also really interesting to discover his again use of some very traditional materials like um, casein to paint and um, even painting some of the contours with oil um, much as uh, Thomas Hart Benton describes um, so here's just some images quickly of what it looks like to actually uh, uncover the mural. We first go around and, and um, use the photographs to guide us to remove the paint that's covering the contours and, um, and then go forward. There are just amazing details and of course the color that came out was something that you couldn't imagine from the black and white photographs, pinks and, and blues and salmons. Um, if you'd like, I have like a quick uh, little video here that shows what it's like to actually clean. Sure, yeah. <laughs> little time-lapse photo that just shows the process. So sort of cleaning the contours first um, the reason that we're using uh, cleaning the contours first and then going forward is because there are lots of different me media. So there is casein, there's oil, there's calcimine. So different areas require um, different solvent protocols to remove them safely. Uh, but the paint that we're removing is oil paint. And, um, and we're just so fortunate that he painted the mural in, in casein, which is a water based, it's like milk paint. Um, so that there was that different type of solubility between oil and um, casein. So we were actually able to recover this mural, which is, seems like something of a mir miracle to me. <laughs> so you start with the contours because it's that oil paint and is that an easier? It's more sensitive. So it, ne it requires a different type of solvent to just carefully remove it but um, it's not as efficient and uh, it's not as compatible with the protocols that are, are best for on top of the sort of flatter colored uh, painted areas that are actually painted in casein. Thank you. This video is incredible to see. <laughs> That's fun. Yeah, so this I wish we knew more about, I wish we knew more about the, the artists, uh, what was in his mind when he was designing this, because the look of it with the colors that you're showing, it just reminds me of Egyptian tomb mm -hmm. paintings. There's something in that palette and the look and feel of it. Absolutely. I mean, there's no denying that, you know, the, the discovery of King Tut's tomb and um, it must have had a huge impact on all artists. And of course, this was the height of the deco era when the Egyptomanie, it was just sort of that that style that was so influential for so many decorative arts things as well. So yeah, I think that it's definitely very influenced by, uh, by Egyptian mural painting. I didn't realize like the eyes and things were so detailed. 
either. I mean, even having, even having seen it with you, I was, you know, I think I was talking too much to it. But it's really fascinating to see it up close, how much detail there is in the, huh. Oops. So this was what it looked like at the end of the first year's campaign. Um, obviously, those fluorescent light fixtures aren't really ideal. Um, and then last year, we worked on the second uh, campaign. And here was removing uh, the top layers of calcinine, uh, Susan Enterline and Rachel Howard. Um, and again, then going to remove the oil paint to sort of reveal these beautiful little details, decorative things that are very much part of Native American art, the decorative qualities. So I, I love that he kind of used or focused on those. Here are some more images in progress. And so this kind of gives you an idea uh, above sort of in progress and then below as, it's, as it looked at the end of the year, the West Wall. Those colors are really gorgeous. So yeah, I can imagine so what a joy so that would have been. This year's um, campaign was delayed because of COVID. So, um, oh, this kind of shows you where the, the, how the freeze sort of starts connecting to each one wall to the next. Um, but this is what's left. So this is what the room looked like. It was just white. And so it's just screaming, asking to be rediscovered. And so we look forward next year to continuing our campaign hope with, with the hopes that COVID is completely um, over by then. Did yeah. you say um, that they're also planning to potentially take out the drop ceiling and replace the lights and kind of get the room back to period? Or is that that's what we would really like to do. But um, of course, it just, you know, it depends on finding people that are willing to fund it. And um, so we that's kind of the second phase would be the architectural conservation phase. Um, the first thing that we'll concentrate is on uh, recovering the mural itself and um, uh, stripping the wood that's, that's kind of uh, jarring. Um, with together with the mural. So we, we just thought we, we would remove that part. The Kinsman Foundation gave us a grant last year to start stripping the wood. And so we'd like to go forward with, um, yeah, replacing the fluorescent lights with pendant, like schoolhouse electric kind of style lights and replacing the windows that are now, um, like many schools, they're about, they've been covered up about half, 50% has been covered. So we'd like to, um, reintroduce original window, the style windows that we know from the blueprints of the school. So that would be, that would be our dream is to recover it completely. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to just call out to something you said in passing, which was you were talking about um, Jenny Allen taking this photograph into the school and figuring out what room it was in. And, and I just really wanted to, to note how important that has been um, to these rediscovering these artworks are the people that go on the hunt. And, you know, and, and oftentimes, you know, like I'll generate a list and say, I know that this school and that school and that school had these things, or I may not even know what they had. I just know they got artwork. And we've had this incredible group of people in Oregon that went and visited all these schools and have gone into other buildings and gone looking and, and didn't take the, the answer, no, there's no painting here. For the answer, they just kept, and they found things in closets and they found things in basements and they have found, you know, things like this where it doesn't look like there's anything there and there's the painting underneath it all. Um, and really we're in more of a, um, an infant phase of that here in Washington state because um, I was shocked the last couple of years while I've been working more on Washington heading toward this exhibition, how many uh, artworks went into how many schools across the state and we don't have the same sort of inventory. So I'm hoping that some of the people um, who either bought the book and seen that list or who are here tonight listening, um, who are uh, retired and have some time or looking for a thesis project or a senior high school project, um, something like that might be willing to take some of those lists and go looking because we have barely begun in Washington State. Yeah, wonderful. We have a great question in the chat um, or in the Q&A, which, we had talked about touching on, um, but it seems like some of these images we unearthed may no longer be very uh, PC or depicting peoples in um, appropriate ways. Uh, so how is that being received? Um, and are there any instances you can share where uh, maybe it's being received negatively? 
Well, the, the mural that I just showed you just now, it was originally, since we had the photographs uh, of the mural before even beginning to do any exploratory testing, there was definitely the question of why would they have overpainted them? Oops, I'm trying to go backwards. Uh, why would they have overpainted the, the mural? And so at that time, Portland Public Schools facility manager and others went um, to the NIA and asked them to review the images and asked them to help determine if it was harmful imagery or not. So in 2007, they said that there was not anything harmful. They did not feel like there was anything harmful in the imagery. And then when I considered sort of picking up this project again in 2016, I reached out to uh, Todd Clark, who's a Native American curator, and talked to him about it and um, sort of asked for not only his input, but also his contribution to help writing uh, interpretive text, which um, I think is a fundamental, really important part of this project. Uh, in, in particular, it's just an amazing opportunity to discuss the Native experience here in Oregon and um, how it was portrayed in the 1930s with respect to how they perceived their own history here and their own relationship with um, people coming to Oregon. So clearly that's something that is a really important learning um, opportunity. This elementary school in particular is lucky to have as a, uh, a grandparent, um, Chet Orloff, who was our one of our um, state's laureate historians who already is kind of helping kids to interpret his Oregon history in the newspapers and whatnot. So he brings a very um, scholarly and thorough um, approach to talking even with elementary school kids about the complexity of the history of the state of Oregon. So we think we're kind of excited about actually that part of it, which is the, you know, the interpretive creating curriculum. As you know, Senate Bill uh, 13 was passed, or you may not know, was passed in Oregon, which now um, creates the obligation to uh, develop curriculum to describe um, Native culture and history in elementaries K through 12. So we hope that this will be part of that process. Great. It is more common though um, for it to be subjects that are not, um, that are either violent or um, derogatory or just potentially problematic in various sorts of ways. And um, I suspect a number of people have seen the stories about the mural at the, by Victor Arnatoff at the school in San Francisco, for example, that's been the center of a huge controversy. Um, Shoot, about I'm not whether... hearing. Um... Oh, sorry. Margaret. Oh, we're not hearing Margaret anymore. I'm hearing you. Oh, OK. <laughs> okay. Um, so that that's another issue that that comes up with a number of these works and then there's the question of so at this moment do we do we take them down do we cover them what do we what do we do with these works and um when you start really looking at the list there are there are hundreds and hundreds of them and um it isn't always easy to find someone to if you just want to take it down and put it in a closet it's hard to find someone to take it and um so and i know nina you've been in the middle of a number of these trying to help different locations solve this and you were you have those images from the University of Oregon um, for yeah. example who has uh, quite a they were a major sponsor and participant um, on the projects in Oregon and asked for a, a variety of artworks all across campus so there's a number of murals and sculptures and even things like um, plant pots and things like that from the WPA that are on the U University of Oregon campus um, but the library in particular, it was being built um, right at this period of time. And so there are a number of artists involved and um, definitely some texts and some images that are there in the library now that have become real flashpoints. Yeah, uh, this one in particular uh, by Nolan Zane that was painted in 1937 and sort of like a manuscript or missive style that carries an inscription um, called Mission of the Mission of a University. And there are, is this passage that I sort of have uh, detail on that, that refers to racial um, heritage 
which has been identified by many students and staff and, and the university as problematic. Um, and in fact, in 2018, um, the piece was vandalized with red paint. And I was asked to come and remove the red paint because they didn't want it to irreversibly damage the, the mural. Um, and so it was removed at that time. They did um, actually put up some interpretive text and the university was in the middle of having created a huge task force to sort of uh, research all of the public art in the Knight Library. And um, they had a student art uh, exhibition that was sort of in response. And um, so they've, they've undertaken quite a bit of outreach and discussion and community discussion. Um, however, they uh, recently um, had uh, further vandalism that made the people believe that they were actually focused primarily on this mural. So I will be um, assisting the university in creating some protective barriers that will uh, cover these murals. And we hope that by covering them, um, the harmful parts of them will be uh, obscured. And, um, and so we'll just kind of bury them so that they could be reconsidered sometime in the future. But for right now, um, it's best uh, for them to be removed from view. And since they are very, uh, they were adhered with lead paste, um, it would be extremely difficult to remove them. It would probably destroy them to try to remove them. So um, this is the much better approach. There are, these are others that are also in the library that will be covered. And so this is sort of the con concept sketch that I will submit to the University of Oregon just so that they can um, approve this type of um, covering. Yeah, because I imagine it's not just like uh, a negative text that you can put away on the shelf and say, that has some historical relevance, um, but it's not really great. Let's not keep it out for everyone. So then when historians or want to come and research it, they can do the appropriate work for it not to uh, traumatize people. Whereas this, like you said, is hard to take down, might destroy the piece, um, but it can still exist for historians to come possibly do something with it in the future, I guess. Yeah. And it's it's complicated, you know, lots of places are wrestling with how best to as best to do this and um, you know, and it, it gets into these arguments about censorship and all of that as well. But there is this sort of particularly for these large murals, you know, you can put interpretive text near it, but you look at like at that image on the left right now, there's this big colorful mural and then there's this little text below. And so the first thing your eye is gonna go to most likely is whatever the picture is. And in, in a number of these instances, I'm thinking of one post office in particular a mural that I know of, and it's just a violent massacre of indigenous peoples. I mean, bloody, disgusting, really violent. And, and if you walk in and see that, you are not gonna stop and read the, you're not gonna notice or even read the interpretive text. You're gonna be hit right in the face with that violent content. And so, and if, if you are of native descent, and are looking at that, you know, what is that doing to you in that moment? So it's a complicated thing. It's like, it's fine to put up interpretation, but is it really enough to kind of counter that, that immediate visceral visual um, attack on people? Um, and, and then there's of course these situations too, where they've had contemporary artists come in and respond with other artworks like the school in San Francisco, where there's actually um, a contemporary artist who created a work to, to try and help discuss some of those issues. And, and sometimes that seems to be the right solution and other times it really doesn't seem to help um, solve the problem. So it's an interesting ongoing debate. And with, of course, with all public art right now, you just have to look at the news about monuments and, and um, yeah. the kind of power that they hold and the power to be the one that, that gets to say things um, versus others. And, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I know uh, the one in San Francisco, my professor Dewey Crumpler actually did the response mural and mm -hmm he's incredible and I love it, but there's that same thing of, like you just said, with that big text panel, you still see the traumatizing imagery. Um, so although then you can rationalize and experience 
the thought behind that uh, as a person who is of that culture, um, you're being triggered and traumatized um, by seeing it. So I understand both sides um, and it's pretty I fascinating. Think we're all in the process of developing a framework of understanding these works because they're not all the same. There's there's quite a you know broad spectrum of um, representations, and some are quite violent, some are overly sanitizing. So I think there has to be a lot of language and sort of more understanding for us. We need some time to kind of develop that framework. Um, so I I think. My, my feeling is always that art is a window into another time, not necessarily a mirror. Um, so I'm hopeful that we will in the future overcome our inequalities and that we'll be able to discuss these um, things perhaps in a different way with language that we don't even have, we haven't even developed yet. Yeah, well, we're, We've answered all our questions. So if anyone who's with us has any more, if you want to throw those in the chat or the Q&A really quickly, we will wrap up. But I just want to thank uh, Margaret and Nina for being with us here tonight. Um, it was a great conversation. I had a blast. Uh, so hopefully everyone else did. Um, I want to invite everyone to come back and join us next week. We're talking um, about some of the government sponsored murals that have gone up in Tacoma recently with the rapid mural project that has been a response to COVID um, and buildings having to close. And then also that has led into buildings having to shutter up for the protests that have been happening. Um, and we're gonna talk to some of the artists and someone from SpaceWorks who has kind of organized that rapid mural project and you can find that on our website and I'm going to just link that in the chat really quick which will disappear at the end of this but we'll hold out for a while for y'all to get that let's do this and I just want to thank you all a couple people have asked about whether there's a recording will be archived or available yeah so we're gonna um I am going to figure that out. And so it might just be sent to you as a as someone who registered and then we'll probably put it on our YouTube channel as well. So this information will be preserved and you can share it for all the folks that didn't get to come tonight. Um, and yeah, so thank you all. Thank you, Amelia. And thanks, Margaret. It's always great yeah. working with you. <laughs> great. Thank you so much for being here tonight and talking about it. always great fun. Have a great night, y'all. Thank you.